Good evening and welcome everyone. We are so happy that you are here with us this evening. My name is Marilyn McFarland and I'm the Senior Director of Principia's Alumni and Field Relations team. The music you heard as you joined was from Principia alum Ian Case as part of the alumni concert that occurred in May of 2020. It is my great privilege to welcome you to this Summer Session 2021 online event. We are missing being with each of you and Elsa this year, but we are grateful that we could zoom in together and expand our Summer Session family to include alumni and friends of Principia from all around the world. We'd love to know where you're joining us from. So if you wanna enter into the chat box, which should appear at the bottom or top of your screen where you are zooming in from. During our summer session events, we have had people joining us from all across the United States, Canada, South Africa, France, Australia, and beyond. And we are so grateful to our global Principia family. Whether you have attended summer session on the Principia College campus in ELSA for over 40 years, one year, or this is your first summer session experience, these next few weeks, what has occurred last week and over the next couple of weeks of online seminars will be filled with enrichment, community, and fun. And we're so glad that each one of you are here with us. We are loving these seminars this month, which are covering topics from Bible to Beethoven, history, like what we're experiencing this evening to art. And we hope that you will Zoom with us from wherever you are across the world to ELSA for a very special summer session social on Saturday night. We hope that you can join us for all of these programs. And if you miss one, don't worry, they are all recorded and will be available on our virtual events webpage following the talk. And I'll put that link in the chat box. Today's talk highlights one of Principia Schools faculty members, Rich Waller as we take a journey back through history and examine what happened around June 15th. From the Magna Carta to the Watergate break-in, who knew that June was such a big month throughout history? We are grateful to, that Rich is here with us today to take us through a few of these events, and I would love to introduce you to him. Rich Waller is a graduate of Principia College and teaches US history at the Principia Upper School. He studied history and business in college and holds an MBA and master's in military history. He began teaching after a 30 year career in sales and marketing. And we are so grateful that he is here with us at Principia. Rich and his wife, Cindy, have two sons who both graduated from Principia School and College. He is a member of the Principia Lifelong Learning faculty teaching history classes at summer session. We encourage you to submit any questions that you have in the Q&A box, and the new Director of Principia Lifelong Learning, Heather Bureau, and I will be monitoring the questions throughout the talk and will follow and will share them uh, with Rich following the talk when he will have an opportunity to answer. Rich, we so appreciate your time today, and I now turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Marley. Marley thank you, and welcome, everybody. Gosh, it's great to have you here. I'm going to just go through the work of getting my uh, my slides up on the screen. I think you'll see mostly slide and just a little bit of me, um, which is probably just as good. So gosh, I, I, I my hope is that you all will hear something interesting as we pick through this. I'm kind of borrowing from an approach that I've used in, uh, I've not taught summer session for very long, but it happened to, I happened to start and continue um, during years that were 75 years after the events of the Second World War. So each summer we talked about the corresponding events of 75 years ago. And uh, with uh, this opportunity, I've kind of uh, uh, thought of the same approach to look at over a much broader span of history, what are some of the events that are significant that have occurred around this time? So I'm hoping uh, um, that I will talk for um, 45, I might drift closer to 50 minutes and we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. As Merrily explained, please um, uh, put those in into there. I think there's a question box that you should be able to see on your screen. And you can, you're welcome to enter those as you think of them. You don't have to keep them in mind till the end, certainly. So I've got to, there we go. 
this is not an exhaustive list, but and, and what I did was tell myself that I would I'd hold myself to events on the 15th or a week on either side. Uh, yeah, a week on either side. So that doesn't, for instance, doesn't quite get us back to June 6th uh, and D-Day. Um, but it's a, a pretty representative list nonetheless. You can see here stretching from 1215 through 1972. Um, and um, I'm going to focus uh, my remarks today on four of these. Um, not that what I've left off uh, is particularly insignificant, but I was trying to think of things that either were really, really uh, surpassingly important or would be of interest to, uh, to you all. So hope I guessed right. These will be the four that I'll talk about. I do have a slide if we're, if we, uh, don't have many questions. I've got a quick slide to just touch on the, the, the uh, just a brief mention of the ones that aren't included here. So Magna Carta, the Battle of Waterloo, Juneteenth, and the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Let's start with Magna Carta, which is arguably perhaps the most significant thing on this list when we take the long view of history. Um, it stands, of course, or it, it its title translate as, translates as the Great Charter. And, and as I'm sure most of you would know or run across, it is the occasion where the English King, John I, grants concessions to the barons in terms of giving up some of his power to at least their oversight. Let's talk about that in a bit more detail. This was not a totally new concept since about 1100, so for 100 years. And 1100 is really just after the Norman conquest of 1066. Kings spoke about promising good government and recognizing that, that, that they're not so far that the, their people, their subjects had rights, but they needed to do right by those they were governing. So the notion that the monarch did have some responsibility to um, govern well was not a new idea, really. Uh, this comes to a head, though, in 1215, largely because of John I, who is uh, not a popular king. In fact, I, I'm, I'm not, not an English monarchical expert, but I don't think there was ever a John II, maybe an indication of the uh, terminal unpopularity of this particular monarch. And he has managed to, uh, un under his leadership, the English have lost their hierarchical lands in Normandy. William the Conqueror, of course, was the Duke of Normandy before he crossed the Channel and conquered England. So the English crown also had charge of Normandy until this point where John lost it. And so in an effort to recover that position, John is seeking to impose particularly heavy taxes on both in, in English church and, and uh, uh, nobility, all the heavier because of course he doesn't have the revenues from Normandy to draw on either. And the, the barons, the highest level of English nobility are feeling particularly concerned about the degree of taxation and they're seeking some protection from that and then also from the next steps, uh, seizure of their lands, and often the enforced, um, um, their, their jailing and the enforced marriage of their wives to somebody chosen by the king is more suitable. So the barons have got at this point actually some reasonable leverage. The treasury is indeed exhausted. John is not just trying to make a bunch of money um, that, to line his pockets. Um, he also recognizes that he is not popular uh, and the, under the Baron's threat of revolt, of provoking a civil war, it's not obvious to John that most people will follow him. And in fact, a civil war does follow this and um, the Barons get plenty of support. It turns out not to be a very significant civil war. We'll touch on that in a moment. We should recognize that although this is rightly um, a major historical event because it's you know, in it we can see the first opening of democratic government or the, the seedling perhaps and the beginning of a um, government of law 
and of, and of limited power. But it is absolutely about the 1% when this was signed. The barons had no interest nor intention of creating a document that preserved the rights of all people. They were just wanting to be sure that they, as the wealthiest people in England, were not going to be completely hammered with taxes. The charter has 63 rules in it, clauses, if, if you will, that obligate the king to do or not do various things. Um, and John largely after signing it, and I should say that it probably was not completed and approved until the 19th of June, but the 15th was the first day of agreement. And in fact, in the signed document, it says that it was signed on the 15th even though in fact all evidence is that it took them several days to work out the fine print, so to speak. John fairly quickly repudiates parts of it um, and uh, the barons do uh, revolt uh, leading to that short civil war I mentioned. It comes to an end fairly quickly when John dies of illness and the barons uh, who have been dallying with getting French support to overthrow John it, turn their backs on that French support and support John's teenage son who becomes Henry II as the new king. So the, the war is not a long lasting or very significant one. The charter is reissued several times in the next 10 years. Some of the rules are deleted, some are changed, but, but fundamentally it remains the same. And it, again, is celebrated if we were asked the question, why do we care about the Magna Carta? It's because of this notion that we've, we've, we have developed the first chink in the wall of absolute monarchical power and begun to introduce ideas having to do with the rule of law. And even though it's revised over 10 years and some things are dropped out, over time in those 10 years, in the 100 years that follow those 10 years, people in Britain become used to hearing a lot of these ideas. And as you can imagine, it's cumbersome to write a document that every time uh, you refer to who's going to benefit you, list the name of the 150 barons, or you talk about only the richest people, you tend to use words like people. And son of a gun, when this document then gets read and used, down through time, people like us begin to think, oh, they meant me. And certainly while the barons did not mean me, uh, it comes to be used that way. And so the ideas in the Magna Carta form the basis of English common law, common because it is to apply to everyone. And certainly the, um, the um, founding fathers of the American Revolution and perhaps more significantly, the framers of the uh, US Constitution were very familiar with these ideas, uh, very familiar with the notion of limits to government and a government of laws. Um, to quote John Adams, who was not at the uh, Constitutional Convention, but certainly influenced it. So what, what apart from this general uh, restriction, a limit on uh, monarchical power, what are some of the provisions that we'd note from Magna Carta? There is a clause in here that absolutely refers to both due process and trial by jury um, that continues through the revisions of Magna Carta and really establishes those concepts in English common law and that therefore borrowed and taken into many law in many places, but certainly the US Constitution. Here's the phrase, I won't quote, this is the only quote I'll have from here, but it's no free man there we go, free man. Um, you know, we're not, we didn't say barons or just wealthiest. Uh, I might decide that I'm a free man. And so I think this applies to me as well, son of a gun. Shall be arrested or imprisoned, except by the lawful judgment of his peers, there's trial by jury, or by the law of the land, there's due process. The um, barons do receive the limits on taxation that they sought. And it's really, um, we can see in this piece, uh, it's, it's a bit of a step, but not much once you think of it, consent of the governed. The limits really, are, there's not a, a 
dollar number or, or monetary number in there. It talks about the consent of the barons to the level of taxation. Again, the barons thought that was just for them, but the notion of consent of the government, of the governed, I'm sorry, is inherent in that. And then, and then the, the vehicle that the barons would have used to protest this is a council of 25 barons that was established within Magna Carta to ensure that the king followed these requirements and they could um, override the king's decrees. I'm simplifying a little bit here, but it's clear that was the intent. So we see here the um, initial appearance of the House of Lords leading eventually to Parliament. So all of, uh, justifiably so, we have some of these specific details that we can trace forward um, in, in law and in the US Constitution. And in general, this idea that there are limits to government power and that the governed should have a say in what the government can do to them. So justifiably, I think, uh, perhaps even the most important of, of all of these events. The Battle of Waterloo takes place in 1815. I'm going to try and cut some corners here with this um, as, as a topic, perhaps, that will have the least interest to anyone listening. But uh, I've included it because any time any historian or group of historians lists the most, certainly the most significant battles of all time, but I've seen lists of the most significant events of all time, and they include Waterloo because it was such a shift or the, the time after the battle was so different than what came before. And that's mostly what we'll talk about. That is really the significance of this particular engagement. The context in this is that Britain and France have been almost continuously at war from 1700 to 1815. That's a good thing for the American colonies, frankly, because the French naval victory off of Yorktown was crucial in that surrender and, um, um, and Britain finally coming to terms with the American uh, colonists. But the last 25 years of this, since 1790, have been fought against revolutionary France, against the France first of uh, uh, um, Robespierre uh, and then later of Napoleon. You can see here that Napoleon here on the top, below here is the Duke of Wellington, the British general who was his opponent at Waterloo. Uh, by about 1805, certainly by 1810, Napoleon was continually victorious in fighting against continental foes and pretty much dominated the continent. By 1810, in fact, he amasses a huge army on the coasts of France and Belgium to prepare to invade um, England, or Britain, I should say, in, in a direct parallel to Hitler in 1940. And Napoleon and Hitler have the same problem. It's those 20 stinking miles of water of the English Channel controlled by the Royal Navy that makes an invasion actually possible. Now, throughout this whole time of conflict in, in, during the, revolution, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic years, Britain has augmented and created opposition to France in Europe by basically subsidizing continental kings, monarchs, to raise armies and to take those armies and fight the French. Britain has a tiny army, but a large navy. And so their army can't do much, although in fact, they end up clearing Spain of, of uh, French influence in between 1808 and 1814. But, but they can certainly funnel gold to Austria or Prussia or Russia in order to keep uh, um, opposition to France going. So following the Russian disaster in 1812, Napoleon is, uh, faces the combined forces of Europe in 1813, loses and abdicates in 1814, and is exiled to the Mediterranean island of Elba for a very short time. He escapes in 1815, and that begins what, uh, what historians call the Hundred Days, which is roughly the time between Napoleon's landing in France and his defeat at Waterloo which then leads to his abdication again. He is restored thanks to the army because as soon as he appears in France, the, the soldiers who um, owe a nominal allegiance to Louis XVIII, the new Bourbon king, um, or I should say restored Bourbon king, uh, 
all feel a much greater loyalty to Napoleon, who they fought with. They all desert and join Napoleon, uh, sort of triumph, triumphantly escorting him into Paris, whereupon the rest of Europe mobilizes their forces to once again squash this uh, Napoleonic cockroach that keeps uh, reappearing. I'm going to skip this. I'm trying to be sure I, I, uh, I'm in to give some time for questions, but I wanted to use the map here. As um, the armies begin to form, the Austrians head here for the Rhine coast. The, the Russians are marching over overland. Two of the coalition armies, a British, Dutch, and German group under the Duke of Wellington, and a Prussian army are starting to form together in Belgium. And Napoleon makes the decision, the only point of having this map here, is to explain why Waterloo, uh, the Battle of Waterloo, takes place in Belgium. Napoleon decides he will go attack and destroy these two smaller groupings of opponents before doubling back and taking on the larger ones that are on the way there. The, um, the battle is a confrontation between uh, British firepower and French shock tactics. The French do most of their work in columns, which are much deeper than they are wide, if that makes sense. The British fight in lines, which are much wider than they are deep. And for many years, these French column tactics have proved successful in breaking linear formations all around the continent because they can cover ground pretty quickly and the, the firepower and accuracy of their opponents has not been enough to stop them. In this case, it is. None of the French columns really get to close with the British lines in a way that would allow them to be broken. There are a couple of isolated incidents, but basically British firepower wins the day over French offensive tactics. Also, the British are really helped by the Prussians who Napoleon has, has defeated and given up for dead, appearing on this side of his line. So Prussian attacks come in over here, forcing him to divert a lot of his troops away and ultimately he's defeated. He doesn't, Napoleon does not do a great job managing in this and it's a horrendous slugging match with, with very heavy casualties. But again, why should we care? because of the impact. Napoleon is forced to abdicate for good, and, um, or I should say permanently, I don't know if it was good or not, but uh, permanently. Um, but the significant thing I think here is this second point. Waterloo, and this is why it keeps appearing, I think, as one of the greatest battles in history, it ushers in 100 years of general peace in Europe. There are, there are wars in Europe, absolutely, in the 1800s. And uh, the Prussians fight the French, the Prussians fight the Austrians and the Danes, the Austrians fight the Italians, the French and British fight the Russians. But the, those are all relatively brief, three months in a couple of cases up to a year and a half in the longest one. And the, the conflicts do not involve all of the powers at once. So what? Well, the, the thought here is that it's not as though this ended and every, all the kings said, oh good, we're through with Napoleon, now we can go on to the Industrial Revolution. But that's what happens. Freed, I think, of the necessity of maintaining armies and um, using resources towards warfare, uh, nations all turn to trade and productivity. The, industrial re the Second Industrial Revolution creates enormous wealth. Um, and to some degree, really, the, it's the first industrial revolution in here as well, really, and by in 1820, you know, that's, we're not even to the second yet. But all the way through those, European countries um, generate wealth. Uh, relative power stays about the same because they're all doing it. The other thing that goes on is nation building, particularly in the case of Germany, because Germany did not exist in the Napoleonic times, just as it really hadn't before. Prussia was the largest kingdom and you know, in the 1400s, Germany was an incredibly fragmented hodgepodge of little tiny states. Uh, even by the Napoleonic times in the early 1800s, it was still very fragmented. Plenty of those little states had coalesced into somewhat larger ones, but Germany was still very fragmented. So one of the stories of the 1800s is Germany coming together, which occurs in 18, after the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. I'm so glad that the, the timing, <clears throat> excuse me, sip here from my Principia mug. Um, 
I'm glad that the timing here allows us to talk about Juneteenth. Um, this is the, uh, the celebration common now in, in many states of the, of the United States, and it commemorates June 19th, hence the Juneteenth amalgam of the day and the, uh, and the date. Um, and this marks the date um, when a proclamation was issued in Texas. So let's talk about the context here. On June 19th, General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston as uh, the newly appointed commander of the Department of Texas. After the Civil War, Southern states were really in essence occupied. I, there were prettier names used. I'm sure Southerners viewed themselves as occupied, but Union forces, soldiers did actually spread out throughout those states. They, were, they had a military general as the head and sometimes there are two or three states combined together, right? Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, I think we're all one. Texas was big enough to be their own department. And upon landing, Granger issues a proclamation, the, the first couple of sentences of which are, are reproduced here. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, we'll talk much more about that, but that's his legal justification, all slaves are free. He goes on, this involves an absolute equality of rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection between them becomes that of employer and hired laborer. The reason why similar announcements were promulgated in each of the southern states as um, commanders took over, but the significance of June 19th, uh, 1865, is Texas is the last southern state where this what infrastructure of Northern control was established. And so this is the last state that is, was informed on the 19th that all slaves are free. Um, uh, I hasten to note here that there was no magic in this. This might have by the following day freed many of the slaves in Galveston but not in fact until Union soldiers spread through the state were slaves actually freed. Owners had every incentive to keep their slaves locked up and they weren't gonna to respond to some notice in Galveston. What did that mean to them? First, it was hard for them to even know what had happened. Second, until they were compelled to do so, they wouldn't necessarily free their slaves and most didn't. So it's not that slavery ended on June 19th in Texas, but at least its death knell was sounded with Granger's announcement. So let's take a look at this. The big story here to me is that legal justification. When Granger spoke about in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, he is speaking about the Emancipation Proclamation, which Lincoln announced in the fall of 1862 uh, to be effective on January 1st, 1863. Uh, Lincoln states that emancipation is a military necessity. And then here's the real punchline. It is to apply only in areas still in rebellion. We'll talk a great deal more about both of those. But to think about that for a moment, it's one of the reasons why there's this few months between the announcement and the effective date is, if we read this wording and we were in Mississippi, what Lincoln is trying to signal to us is, hey, if you guys decide to leave the Confederacy and return to the Union, you can keep your slaves. It applies only in areas still in rebellion. And I'm sure he wanted to give that opportunity, at least for some debate. Certainly none of the Confederate states were going to do that, none do. There's, it's not even close, and I really don't think Lincoln expected that to happen. But as I say, at least an opportunity to create some debate on it. So unusual, military necessity and only an area still in rebellion. Why is that? So the explanation for it starts with this map. This is the uh, electoral map from the election of 1960, which elected Lincoln. You can see here Lincoln is the green, uh, wins 180 electoral votes and 40% of the popular vote. 
doesn't matter that he only gets 40% of the popular vote, right? What matters in the United States is that you win the electoral vote and Lincoln does. He does, he, uh, one of the things I'll, I'll ask my class sometimes with this is, um, gee, is, did Lincoln win this because of the split in the voting? You know, there were four candidates. Very often in our history when we've got even just three and the, the, the third candidate is a serious and significant one, it makes quite a difference. But in this case, when you look at this, and you guys may have been quicker on a, quicker than, um, than to, to figure this out, 180 electoral votes wins no matter what. If you added up all the other electoral votes, then Lincoln still wins as long as you assume he gets the same votes. He was not even on the ballot in 10 of the Southern states. So they had no opportunity for voting for him. The, but the, one of the, I think the strange things about this is to look here at this chart and see Stephen Douglas, who, uh, who was the representative of the, of the Northern Democrats, the Democrats split into Northern and Southern parties here, um, gets no, no, really no significant votes in the South, but look, he gets 12 electoral votes. He's way behind in the electoral vote standing, but look at that, 30% of the popular vote a strong second to Lincoln, even though he garners very few electoral votes. How can that be? Well, those of you who follow US electoral politics will know that answer right away. What happened is in the Northern states, which is the only place really those two were serious candidates, Lincoln wins virtually every state by a small margin. So the popular votes are quite close, right? But because Lincoln wins every state by that small margin, he gets all the electoral votes. Only, only New Jersey at the time split their votes. That's why our Douglas gets three over here. Um, so uh, what this means is the Congress that Lincoln is dealing with, first off, obviously all the Southern states go away, right? There's, there are no, none of them represented in Congress. But Lincoln's Congress has got a lot of Northern Democrats, right? This level of popular support for the Democrats means that there are plenty of them, and there are in, in Congress. And the Democrats are, to a man, opposed to emancipation. They are committed to the idea of uh, restoring the Union, but um, based on lots of things that had happened as the parties developed, utterly opposed to emancipation. And there are enough Republicans also opposed to emancipation because the, the Republican platform in 1860 was not to eliminate slavery. It was simply to limit it to where it then was, to oppose its expansion, but not to fuss with it where it already existed. And so there are enough Republicans that Lincoln knows won't vote for this either. He cannot get emancipation through Congress. He knows that. Here's the other issue. As we look here at the map, the states in green are called the border states, you can see down here. They are the four states which allow slavery that do not leave the Union and join the Confederacy. And there are various reasons. In some cases, there's a lot of uh, Northern arm twisting, uh, but, and there is a vigorous debate in at least three of them. I'm not sure about Delaware but in at least Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland about whether they should secede or not. And the earliest months of the war, th that is the prize. Both North and South are trying desperately to woo these states, particularly those big three, into one side or another. And um, as we come to 1862, they certainly, they have not left officially to join the Confederacy and in general, northern interests are succeeding in all three of those states. They are more in the northern camp than in the southern. And in Kentucky's case, that's because large parts of it have been occupied by northern troops, kind of compelling uh, allegiance, if you will. But Lincoln is very nervous about offending the folks in the border states. He, he does not want to give them any reason to be angry with the Union and perhaps restart the, the debate about joining the Confederacy or worse, actually join it. So when Lincoln looks at the Emancipation Proclamation, he's got three issues with this. The first one is Congress won't pass it. 
hard to get a law in place that Congress doesn't pass. Two, he's really worried about offending the border states. And three, uh, his advisors are unanimous that he can't, um, given the fact that the North has been steadily defeated throughout 1862, to come up with this proclamation uh, 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 with a weak hand, so to speak, will look like a desperate throw of the dice to mix my gambling metaphors there between cards and dice. They, he, they urge him to wait until there's a union battlefield success so he's coming from a stronger perspective. So with those hurdles, what does Lincoln do? Congress won't pass the bill. Ah, turns out the Constitution establishes the president as the commander in chief of the, of the armed forces. So this can be issued as a military order. Congress never sees it, has no ability to debate it or pass judgment on it. It just gets handed down. Today, we call this an executive order. We could indeed have military ones too, I'm sure. But I, I, and I've not done enough research to tell you this for sure, but I think this may be the first executive order. Nowadays, eight or 10 of them drop on any given day, it seems like. But back then, this was a little unusual, but it's Lincoln's way of bypassing Congress so that this doesn't have to be killed in the process. Two, how are we going to apply the border? And that, which is why then it's issued as a military necessity. Number two, how are we going to not offend the border states? Oh, let's have this apply only to states that are in rebellion. The border states are not in rebellion. They may be restive, they may be roiling, they may have unhappy people in them, but they're not in rebellion. So this will not apply to them causing them theoretically no offense. And finally, the Battle of Antietam is at, le at least looks and smells enough like a Union victory. Um, and, and to be fair, it is, it's a big missed opportunity, but it gives Lincoln the top cover to uh, issue this. So um, the irony of the Emancipation Proclamation, as you look at this, that may have occurred to some of you is, it, while it is justifiably celebrated as eliminating slavery, it applies only where it cannot be enforced. It applies only in states in rebellion, and there is no mechanism for Lincoln to cause those states to free their slaves. That's what the war is about. So the Emancipation Proclamation requires the success of Northern armies to be effective. And indeed, as we go through the latter parts of the war when Northern forces are more effective, Slaves flock to the blue coats whenever they're within, you know, walking or migrating distance. And so the armies make this effective. The success of Union forces makes it effective. And hence Granger, now being sent out to Texas with his brief um, of running the state until it re returns to the Union, has makes it effective. Oops, I skipped. So out of the impacts of the Emancipation Proclamation, first African-American enlistment, uh, great numbers of former slaves and free, free African-Americans joined the Northern forces, making a significant contribution. It establishes slavery as a war aim. The North is now fighting not just to restore the Union, but also to free slaves. And that part means that European nations cannot now support the South. Britain, particularly, which was the big one where the South was hoping to get some support, is committed to opposing both the slave trade and the institution of slavery. Now to be seen as supporting the South would be death for any British politician because he would be seen as supporting slavery. The reason why this is the operative law for Granger on June 15th or June 19th, sorry, 1865, is that the 13th Amendment was passed on January 31st, 1865 by Congress, the first step in creating an amendment. But then states have to go ratify that amendment. And so through 1865, we're in the ratification process. The amendment is finally ratified on December 6th, 1865, supplanting the Emancipation Proclamation as a law is considered higher than an executive order. It prompts me just to mention that if those of you who may have seen or might be interested in seeing again the movie titled Lincoln, 
which seems to me like it was five years ago, but that probably means it was 10 years ago, um, is a really wonderful portrayal of Lincoln pushing the 13th Amendment through. And principally, he is concerned about that because if freeing slaves is a military aim applying to states then in rebellion, what happens if there's no war and no rebellious states? The courts could conceivably overturn that. And that's why he wants the 13th Amendment so badly, so that we actually have a legitimately passed congressional document that supports the end of slavery. Final one, I'll try and cut some corners here. I've gone longer than I thought. The Battle of the Philippine Sea. This is in here a little bit uh, as an homage to uh, uh, Jim Belote, my, uh, who many of you may have known, my uh, uh, history teacher at Quinn College, my advisor. Uh, he and his brother uh, um, wrote a series of books about the uh, war in the Pacific, including one about carriers. And the Battle of the Philippine Sea is the fifth of five great carrier engagements between the US Navy and the Japanese Navy. Uh, this occurs, at, um, again, cutting some corners here, I'll talk less about Spruance maybe, but in the Pacific, the, the Americans, and it was really an American war, conducted themselves really from, from two um, fronts or approaches. Douglas MacArthur with American and Australian army units worked his way up from New Guinea heading for the Philippines, while the US Navy and the, uh, the soldier component of the Navy, the Marines, came across the Central Pacific under the command of Chester Nimitz, Admiral Nimitz. I got to put in a quick plug for Nimitz, who I think is almost certainly the best US commander uh, in World War II. George Marshall, the chief of staff of the army, could be a, is a very close second, but the, the drop-off from the two of them to whoever is third is significant. Um, this occurred, uh, before I talk about the, how it happened, I always, it, it's interesting for me to take a look at a very tangible piece of evidence dealing with US industrial production. And truthfully, while the United States does fantastic things in their military, the courage and energy and indeed contribution to winning the war is unmistakable and not to be diminished. The biggest single thing the US does to win World War II is make stuff. And we give it to our allies, the British and the Russians, certainly we certainly make plenty for ourselves. So just to look for a moment at aircraft carriers, which are the crucial weapon system in the Pacific War. If we look, uh, and, and carriers can be broken into two broad classes, fleet ca carriers, which are the big um, vessels holding 70 to 90 aircraft, and then a, a group of intermediate carriers, which are faster to build, and they'll hold 40 to 50. We're not talking here about the little tiny escort carriers, which were a third class that really didn't take part in, in fleet operations much. Pre-war, the Japanese have six fleet carriers. Those are the six that attack Pearl Harbor and five intermediate sized carriers, while the US has five fleet and two intermediate. Close to parity, right? Throughout the war years, the Japanese build five more fleet carriers, um, one of which is sunk in Tokyo Harbor on its uh, builder's trial, never has a plane land on it. US submarine uh, Archerfish sinks it. And then two more intermediate. So not even quite doubling what they had before war. The US builds 24 fleet carriers and nine intermediate ones. So, and the Japanese knew this was going to happen. Uh, they recognized the problem they had in taking on the, uh, the US industrial giant. But I've always thought that amongst the many statistics one could throw up, this always to me makes the disparity clear. The Japanese are expecting to, come on, as we go on. Yep, Japanese are expecting this to be a decisive battle. They design their philosophy around that. They're going to wipe out the US fleet. The US goals are a little more limited. Uh, uh, Spruance, the admiral in charge, is given the task of protecting the landings in Saipan. We want Saipan because we can base the new giant B-29 four-engine bombers there and actually reach the Japanese mainland. So the point of capturing Saipan is to set up uh, aerial bombardment of Japan. In the Philippine Sea, the Japanese have nine carriers, five fleet, four intermediate and 750 aircraft, 300 of which are land-based on Guam and Saipan and other Mariana Islands. 
The U.S., on the other hand, is superiority in carriers, seven fleet, eight intermediate, and about 900 aircraft. The longer range of the Japanese aircraft means most of the fighting is over the U.S. fleet. And we can see here, I think this is one of the U.S. intermediates, Independence, with, with uh, bombs bursting around her. Um, there are four major Japanese strikes during the day. And the key point to this battle is the Japanese naval air arm is virtually wiped out. I show here that uh, um, uh, perhaps 200 of the uh, 750 survive. That's probably generous too. It, that could be as little as 100. Um, the, there are few, no US ship is significantly damaged. Two of the Japanese fleet carriers are sunk by US subs and a third one by US aircraft attack. So um, the, the Japanese uh, carrier force is not wiped out, but it's completely ineffective because it has no trained pilots to use. Um, that evening strike from the US carriers is done at extreme range and the recognition is they'll be flying home after dark with emptying fuel tanks. One of the legendary parts of this battle is the US Admiral risking submarine attacks has all of his ships illuminate, shine searchlights into the air, light up the landing decks, everything else. Half of the aircraft are still lost, but many of them ditch close by and 75% of the crews are saved. So uh, um, Mitchell's uh, pilots love him. Spruance decides to not um, chase the Japanese and sink their last remaining carriers. His task after all was to guard the, si the landings in Saipan. He does so letting the shell of the Japanese Navy escape. He gets some grief for that, but um, probably the right call. All right, I've given us barely uh, uh, 10 minutes, uh, I, but I'd be delighted to break it there and uh, just see if we have uh, any questions or if you haven't sent them to Heather, uh, feel free to uh, do so now. Heather, of any, do you, do you have any on hand as yet? Hey, Rich, we haven't collected any at this time, but folks, you can enter your questions right now in the Q&A box and we'll keep an eye out for those. And in the meantime, Rich, if you wanted to touch on a few of those additional events that fell outside of that week range, we'd love to hear more. Sure, I, we've got, I, I can do that. and. Uh, that's great news. Either I've been very clear or you all aren't interested in the least. And I, I hope it's the former and, and not the latter anyway. Um, I did think uh, to fill up a little bit of time here just to give us a, a bullet or two about four of the things that I didn't include. The one other thing that actually happened on the 15th is the first um, the Northern failure to capture Petersburg, Virginia at the end of the Overland campaign grant has been directing the, the Northern Army in the East, has been locked up with Lee's Army of Northern Virginia um, for three months. Uh, Grant is continually put in the position of having to attack, so his casualties are much greater than Lee's. But in the long run, Grant can replace casualties and Lee can't. But right at the end of this, what looked like a very unimaginative slogging campaign, Grant cleverly slips around Lee's flank, finally, and has the opportunity to capture the rail depot at Petersburg, which totally controls rail access into Richmond. If the North holds Petersburg, Richmond has to be evacuated. Would that have ended the war? I don't know that it would have on the spot, but I do believe it certainly might have shortened it by the nine months difference between June of 64 and then April of 65. However, the Union commander, uh, Baldy Smith, has just had his men chewed up by attacks on Confederate fortifications, and he moves very cautiously. There are hardly any Confederates there in Petersburg, but they manage to bluff him into thinking there are more. He is slow, he waits to bring everybody up, and by the time he does attack, Lee has shifted enough troops into the fortifications that he's defeated. So the North fails, the point of the battle is North, the North fails to capture Petersburg and then settles down for a siege. Petersburg is besieged from June through late March of the next year. And finally, the breaking of the siege is kind of the last act of the war. In 1941, Hitler makes the decision to invade the Soviet Union um, with the, you know, the large, an army that was three times larger than Napoleon's. Um, uh, Operation Barbarossa it certainly turns out to be Hitler's greatest mistake. 
despite tremendous early successes, the, uh, uh, the Nazis have been delayed by probably at, at most three weeks by having to clean up some issues in the Balkans in Yugoslavia and Greece. And the Russian winter comes early in 1941, stopping the Germans short of Moscow. Um, it's Hitler's greatest mistake because a little bit, as I said, with the US industrial production, I mean no disparagement to the armed forces of the West. My grandfather was a captain in the Australian Navy. Um, tremendous gallantry shown by uh, all of the US, Britain and Commonwealth forces in their successes, which do make a contribution to ending the war and more than just a contribution, that sounds too mild. But the fact still is that 85% of the German army's war effort is spent in the Soviet Union after 1941. So um, uh, truthfully, the Soviets do a lot of the heavy lifting and suffer a commensurately much higher level of casualties than the Western powers. The Mississippi summer murders, I, I made a plug for the Lincoln movie a minute ago. If any of you uh, uh, can find, I, I don't know where you would, but uh, the movie Mississippi Burning, which I think is Gene Hackman's breakout role, uh, it, is about this story, which it's uh, uh, the summer of 1964, the effort was to send US uh, college students from the North down into the South, into Mississippi particularly, to uh, register voters. Uh, Mississippi had the largest number of, has the, had the largest, I think I'm right, in number of potential black voters and the lowest number of voters registered. So it was chosen as a symbolic effort the first one of these teams to uh, head down south, they were all trained in Oxford, Ohio at Miami of Ohio University, uh, disappears within 24 hours or 48 hours of getting to Mississippi. Their bodies are eventually found in a dam that was an earth dam that was being built at the time. And the movie is the story of that discovery because it's felt that the, um, the local law enforcement cannot be trusted to solve this. The FBI is bought in. And I, it, it's crossing states if we figure that the victims were from another state and their right to not trust Northern law enforcement, it was uh, some of the deputy sheriffs who had killed them. Sadly, perhaps because it was a couple of white uh, uh, college students, white males, this was particularly noticed in the North. Um, and when I say particularly, it's the end of a long series of building evidence of, of the, um, the harm done by Jim Crow laws, um, the separate but equal laws. But this is kind of the culminating piece where outrage that this sort of thing could happen tips the scales so that J Lyndon Johnson, a Southern president who courageously stands up for what he thinks is right in this, is able to persuade Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964 mm -hmm. and then the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So the, the Mississippi murders, which occurred, I think it was June, June 20th. And then finally, uh, in 1972, uh, I think it was uh, the 19th, is the date of the Watergate break-in, right? The original break-in into Democratic headquarters in the Watergate building where the perpetrators uh, are unbelievably inept they are arrested by a night watchman. The whole purpose of this was to gather dirt on uh, uh, Nixon's upcoming opponents in the 1972 election, which he wins absolutely crushing George McGovern. There was no need for him to, to go this far. And indeed, in fact, truthfully, the evidence is that Lincoln, that was Lincoln, woo, Nixon did not know in advance of this chicanery. It was being done by you know, lower management, if you will, people who are part of the committee to reelect the president. The problem for Lincoln was he, uh, Nick, Nixon, wow, having the two, the two are not similar in any way. <laughs> um, problem for Nixon is he becomes so committed to covering this up that it's the cover up that gets him in trouble. He, the lying about what was going on and his efforts to divert attention away from it. So two years later then in uh, 74, um, he will be the only president who's resigned. And he does that because it's very clear that if he doesn't resign, he will become the only president to be convicted upon impeachment. We've had three tried 
but not convicted under impeachment. It was very obvious that he would be thrown out of office. So he chose to resign rather than face that. There are probably some of you who know a great deal more about Watergate than I do. I've not, I can't say that I've studied it. There were some principia connections too in, in the Nixon White House. And I've heard some of them speak very eloquently about um, you know, how mesmeric some of these things were and it took them, it was hard to even recognize the, the right thing to do, but it was very courageous of them to talk about that later. I enjoyed hearing from them uh, very much. Well, good. Rich, we, 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 do have a few, we do have a couple questions coming awesome. in. Awesome. Um, if you have just a, a few minutes to take those, um, we'll, we'll go back a bit. And given your ranking of Nimitz and Marshall, where would you rank Patton? Um, he probably makes top 10, but I, um, I find, um, I, I do admit to a prejudice. I have a real issue with commanders with egregious egos. I therefore have little patience for Montgomery, Patton, or MacArthur, who were certainly successful and perhaps narrowly so, but I shrink from thinking of them as great commanders because that ego is so untrammeled. And so Patton would be in my top 10, but he's going to be seven or eight, I would think. I would have Spruance, the commander of the US fleet at, um, at the Philippine Sea, well, well above Patton. Okay. Uh, next question. What is the history of the Electoral College and why was it created? Has it changed over the years? Wow, that is a really tough, short question. Um, the, the fastest way I can try and cut to that is when uh, the dudes in Philadelphia, the framers, were designing the Constitution, the question became, how are we going to elect a president? Well, popular vote was not very practical at that time, not only it, but it wasn't impossible to vote and collect it. But the real issue was how would us out in the wilds of Kentucky have any knowledge of John Adams? We, we've never seen John Adams. He certainly isn't gonna to travel to Kentucky to meet us. And how are we gonna be qualified? The only person we might know in politics is the mayor of our town. So the, the framers were not prepared to basically have unknowing people cast votes. Their solution to this was, hey, let's have each state legislature nominate smart guys. They can't be members of Congress because then they've got a vested interest in who they work with, but they could be members of the state legislature or people of wealth or anything like that. And those smart guys will go to Washington and they'll be given a blank sheet of paper and they are to write down two names. The person who gets the most votes is president. The person who gets the second most votes will be vice president. And that's the solution they came up with to break this, the problem, which is as much as anything, a, a question of communication and knowledge. Has it changed? Yes. One of the early things that happens is if once you start getting political parties um, in, the, in the 1800 election, everybody who liked Jefferson and Aaron Burr wrote their two names down. Uh, all the people of, that we would have called the Jeffersonian Democrats. Um, and so you had a tie and that was then changed where electors will write down two names, but one will be for president and one will be for vice president. That's a constitutional amendment because you have to do that to change this. The next change that came along was by about the Jacksonian time in the mid 1800s, states started to say, oh, instead of just sending a couple of smart guys to Washington and they vote however they want, because remember, you just got a blank sheet of paper. Now you got there maybe a week earlier and while having dinner in the taverns, you talk to other electors about, gee, should it be this guy or that guy? But what the states started to say was, hey, we're actually going to put presidential candidates on ballots and a vote for that president, a vote for that candidate, we will instruct our electors to vote for the person who gets the most votes in the state. So electors, it's no longer just up to you. You are now reflecting our state's votes. And that was possible. Remember communications was the big problem back in when the constitution was written. That became possible by two things. The first one is parties, which 
were anathema to the early founders. Washington spent most of his eight years railing against the problem of parties and wishing they would never happen, but they do. So once you've got parties, I may never see um, John Quincy Adams or, um, or Jackson in my town, but hey, my neighbor, the hardware store owner is active in democratic politics and I trust him so he can tell me to vote for the Democratic Party candidate. And so I, and, and newspapers also solve some of that problem. So voters can now be aware of candidates and can vote for them. And that vote then drives the elector who goes off. Um, and in the early days, just as it is now, it's winner take all. So those I think would be the most significant changes. We certainly uh, regularly have questions about about changing this and there are a number of propositions in float, some of them probably not feasible. A couple of others could actually happen to try and tie the results of the electoral college more closely to the popular vote, which is usually seen as the problem. You know, we don't, it, it's not a great mirror. And then the last several elections, that's been more of an issue than it had been in all of the elections before really. So that I definitely cut some corners in that, but I hope that's, interesting of interest to, to that question that that is interesting rich and, and thank you for that explanation I, I have a few more questions um the next one is was one of the basic purposes of the emancipation proclamation to keep britain and other european countries from recognizing the confederacy as an independent country that is certainly an effect and i wouldn't pretend that lincoln wouldn't have had that in mind um, there were, that was not, you know, that was not obvious that that was absolutely going to happen, but I'm, I am sure Lincoln has not left a record saying, this is why I did it. That included, that includes a reference to that, but certainly it has that effect. The question really is asking, was it motivated by that? Um, I think the evidence we have is that it was a subsidiary factor, perhaps, but not an overt one. Okay, and then I have a couple more and then we'll have to wrap it up. So I'm but, gonna lump these together because um, it'll, it'll involve your opinion. And who uh, is your favorite Civil War general? And then if you can leave us with letting us know of any books you recommend related to your World War II discussion. Sure. Um, Although, gosh, I, I should have prepared better for that as well. My, uh, I have uh, two in the Civil War. Uh, one, uh, my, my favorite is actually George Thomas. And I've already re revealed a preference for l less excitable, more, uh, more humble personalities in command. And Thomas fits that for sure. Um, and I think makes major contributions. The other is Grant. There's been a big swing recently, and we, there have been a couple of major Grant biographies recently, but he is being recognized more and more. A lot of the um, early stories exalting Lee, and it was easy to cast Grant as the simpleton who just, because he had a bigger army, was wasteful of human life and just battered Lee into submission. And Southerners have tended to tell that story because it looks better for them, right? It fits the lost cause argument. But Grant actually was a really excellent strategist. Plenty of evidence of probably a better strategist than Lee who maybe was better at tactics. But I think Grant has moved up from my early years of reading about him was kind of a, well, well, how could you have lost under his circumstances? Um, the, gosh, the Battle of the Philippine Sea uh, question that, there's, a, 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 I tend to go back to books that I, first off, um, the Belot book is I think called uh, Carrier Warfare. I'm sure long out of print, but if somebody could find an, you know, an old copy of that, uh, that would be, an, it, certainly we have the Principia connections of the two brothers with that. Um, the, the best uh, treatment of the Naval War, the US Naval War in World War II is a, a one volume uh, called The Two Ocean War. It's by Samuel Eliot Morrison, who was the official uh, US historian, wrote a gigantic, I don't know, 15 volume maybe 
um, history of naval operations in the war. Two Ocean War is the summary of that. The Battle of the Philippine Sea has only a chapter, but, it, but still Morrison writes really well. It's easy to read. And um, that's one of the options I would think from a bibliography standpoint to give you big picture as well as you know a section on, on this. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rich, thank and you. Thank, you. thank you for your time today. This was excellent. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on behalf of the Alumni and Field Relations and Lifelong Learning team. We're just thrilled for this talk and this walk back in history. Who knew? Who knew that all of this stuff happened around this time in June? So thank you so much, Rich. We hope that you will join us for our upcoming summer session events. Our next event is taking place on Thursday with Dr. Shirley Paulson for part two on the Gospel of Thomas. So we hope to see you Thursday for that. Saturday for the summer session social, where you will see some old friends and meet some new friends and just get to experience some of those favorite summer session social elements and memories. So thank you all so much. We will be emailing you a link to the recording from today's talk within the next 48 hours. Thanks again so much and have a wonderful night. Bye. Bye.